For those of you unfamiliar, the tiered iceberg is a very popular image format where concepts relating to a certain topic are collected together and ranked from the most popular surface level all the way down to the most obscure, esoteric, and confusing. Today, I'll be taking a look at the Doctor Who iceberg and briefly explaining each topic listed. As I'm sure you've gathered, the beginning is filled with simple information that's easy to understand, so please be patient as we work our way down to the truly bizarre in the depths below. If any of these topics seem interesting to you, don't hesitate to drop a comment on it down below, and maybe I'll make a more focused and in-depth video on it sometime down the line. Also, if you're a Doctor Who fan and you'd like to see more of my content in general, please subscribe and leave a like on this video. It really helps with the YouTube algorithm. All right, enough of the intro. Let's dive in. Tier 1. These topics are all general knowledge about Doctor Who. Even if they've never watched a single episode of the series, most people will be aware of these things through simple cultural consciousness. The BBC. The British Broadcasting Corporation, abbreviated as BBC, is the public service broadcasting company founded in 1922, headquartered in London. It owns the production and distribution rights to Doctor Who, which premiered on November 23, 1963. David Tennant The Tenth Doctor, David Tennant, is arguably the most popular incarnation of the character. The second actor to take on the role after the show's revival in 2005, he is often credited for the series' massive rise in popularity. He was so popular that the BBC considered cancelling the program when he announced his departure in 2010, out of fear that no one would watch without him. TARDIS Time and relative dimensions in space. This is a time and space ship used by Time Lords to travel the universe. The Doctor's TARDIS, a Type 40, has a broken chameleon circuit. This means that its cloaking feature is always malfunctioning, stuck as a 1960s police box, the form it took when the first Doctor arrived on Earth. The most notable feature of the TARDIS is that, due to trans-dimensional engineering, the inside of the ship is bigger than the outside. Time Lord The Doctor is a Time Lord, a race of humanoid aliens that differ in many ways. The most important differences are that Time Lords do not age, or at the very least, they age very slowly. This means that many Time Lords live to be thousands, if not millions of years old. Secondly, Time Lords are far more intelligent than humans, with mental processing power and deductive abilities far beyond most high-speed computers. Bowties are cool. This was a phrase commonly spoken by the 11th Doctor. It was in reference to the bow ties he always wore, usually said in response to questioning or mockery. Interestingly enough, Eleven's tenure as the Doctor actually positively influenced the sale of bow ties around the world, more than doubling their market capitalization over several years. Sonic Screwdriver This is a high-tech, multi-purpose tool that the Doctor typically carries at all times. Its features are constantly fluctuating. While originally its purpose was simply to turn screws, it now can hack computers, open locks, rewire circuitry, and that's just scratching the surface. Today, it primarily exists for merchandising and plot convenience. Daleks The Daleks are the Doctor's greatest enemy, and most popular as well, a race of genocidal aliens that each pilot their own individual war machine, a set of armor with a laser weapon and manipulator tool. Daleks are an iconic staple of the series, most famous for the phrase they often repeat, exterminate. Tom Baker Tom Baker is the one actor who can compete with David Tennant for the role of most popular Doctor. He served as the fourth actor to take on the role for the longest tenure of any incarnation, seven series from 1974 to 1981. His image and persona are considered by many to be the prototype, the most concentrated and pure example of what it means to be the Doctor. Tier 2 these topics are simple concepts that a viewer will pick up after watching a season or two of the show, typically the Revival series. Most casual fans fall into this category. K-9 A futuristic robot dog, this was a companion of the fourth Doctor in the 1970s, and another staple of Doctor Who iconography. K-9 was most useful for his encyclopedic knowledge and the laser-mounted weapon in his nose. Starring in several spin-offs, the character did make a brief appearance in the Revival series, along with Sarah Jane Smith. Gallifrey The home planet to all Time Lords, and the believed birthplace of the Doctor. This massive orange planet is marked by the Citadel, a utopia-like city contained in a glass bubble. 
only Time Lords are permitted inside the Citadel, as Time Lord is actually a rank to be achieved. Those who live outside are simply known as Gallifreyans. Two Hearts As a Time Lord, the Doctor's physiology differs greatly from humans. The most notable difference is that he has two hearts, a binary cardiac system. Other interesting differences include a respiratory bypass system that allows them to survive strangulation, three brain stems, and an internal body temperature of 15 degrees Celsius, or 59 degrees Fahrenheit. The Doctor, not Doctor Who. The titular character of the series is not named Doctor Who. The title he goes by in-universe is simply The Doctor. This concept is in reference to the way fans of the show will correct non-fans who assume the character's name is Doctor Who. Hulock Hulock is an abbreviation of Doctor Who and Sherlock, two popular British TV dramas both helmed by Stephen Moffat in the early 2010s. The term originated on Tumblr, where fans of both series would envision stories where the heroes of both shows could meet and interact. This concept was also used as a blanket term, a signifier in blog bios that let visitors know you were a member of both fandoms. This was often abbreviated further to Super Who Lock, which included the CW series Supernatural. Regeneration Regeneration is a physical process that Time Lords undergo upon receiving a fatal injury. Welling up with regeneration energy, they are perfectly healed, but every cell in their body is altered to match new DNA. While regeneration changes physical appearance, it also has a tendency to alter the personality of whoever undergoes it. The process appears to be a physical skill that can be controlled, as characters like Romana and the Master have shown varying degrees of chosen customization when changing their bodies. Tier 3 at this stage, we have knowledge that is generally accepted among more engaged fans of the show. They likely own at least one piece of Doctor Who merchandise, and usually have a few friends who also watch the show. Night of the Doctor This short one-off special aired exclusively online as a prelude to the 50th anniversary special, The Day of the Doctor. This marked the first on-screen appearance of Paul McGann reprising his role as the 8th Doctor since the 1996 television movie. This was also his final adventure, leading to his regeneration and subsequent entry into the last great time war. Classic Who This is the first 26 seasons of Doctor Who, airing from 1963 until its cancellation in 1989. It spans the television adventures of the first seven Doctors, from William Hartnell to Sylvester McCoy. Depending on who you ask, the 1996 movie could be considered the final episode of Classic Who, although many consider it in a separate category from both classic and modern Who. Time Lord Victorious The Time Lord Victorious is a story concept conceived by Russell T. Davies to be explored during the final stint of the Tenth Doctor's run. Due to the nature of the span of episodes, shown only as four specials instead of a proper season, the Time Lord Victorious concept was contained primarily in the episode The Waters of Mars. In this episode, the Doctor, overcome by grief and frustration, breaks the laws of time, choosing to change a fixed point and save the life of a woman who was meant to die. He deems himself the winner, the sole survivor of the Time War, the Time Lord Victorious. His hubris is quickly checked, however, when the woman he saved takes her own life in order to preserve the timeline. This concept and dark mental state was later explored in the multimedia Time Lord Victorious series, where the Tenth Doctor descends down a path of villainy, determined to alter the fabric of the universe itself. War Doctor The War Doctor refers to the incarnation of the Doctor between the Eighth and Ninth, who spent his entire life battling in the Time War. Because he rejected his title of healer and wise man in order to wage war, he also did not use the moniker of Doctor during this time. Portrayed by John Hurt, he was revealed in the Series 7 finale Name of the Doctor, and featured prominently in The Day of the Doctor, where he was shown once again accepting the title before regenerating into Christopher Eccleston's incarnation. Influenced Regeneration this concept refers to the idea that regeneration is a process that can be influenced by both the conscious and subconscious mind of the Time Lord undergoing it. We've seen Romana and the Master both consciously alter their appearance, but there have been clues that the Doctor, who is less skilled in regeneration, subconsciously influenced his own. 
The most obvious clue is when the Twelfth Doctor recalls seeing his own face on Caecilius during the Tenth Carnation, as a way to remind himself to always save as many people as possible. Other, more subtle hints include Ten's young, handsome appearance and more human emotionality as a result of falling in love with Rose Tyler, and Eleven's young face and whimsical nature as a response to being in his final incarnation. Even Twelve's Scottish accent could be attributed to missing Amelia Pond, who Eleven envisioned in his final moments. The Hybrid The Hybrid is a concept introduced in Series 9 an ancient Time Lord prophecy born from the Matrix, a collection of minds uploaded from the experiences of every Time Lord. The prophecy stated that a hybrid creature, born of two warrior races, would stand over the ruins of Gallifrey and unravel the web of time, breaking a billion billion hearts to heal its own. After surviving the Time War, Lord President Rassilon feared that the hybrid would soon appear and lead to Gallifrey's fall. While it was often believed that the two warrior races were Time Lord and Dalek, this was never specified in the prophecy. While there have been many candidates for this role throughout the series, the Doctor and Clara Oswald are definitively the hybrid, as they are the only instance in which every element of the prophecy is met. I have more on that in this video here if you're interested. Torchwood Torchwood is most well known for the Torchwood Institute, the British secret service established by Queen Victoria to protect the world from alien threats. This institute was the focus of the spin-off series of the same name, which featured Captain Jack Harkness in the lead role. The name Torchwood originated as an anagram of Doctor Who, which was used to label tapes of the revival series to prevent pirating and leaking online. Doctor Who, not the Doctor. This idea is in reference to the fact that, when the series was first airing, referring to the titular character as Doctor Who was deemed as acceptable and even commonplace. Even if the character was just called Doctor in universe, he was credited as Doctor Who, and was referred to as such by many people who spoke of the show. Because of this, those who tout it's the Doctor, not Doctor Who, are ironically showing their lack of knowledge and experience with the series. Tier 4 these are serious fans of the show. They not only have watched the majority of the available episodes, but they likely enjoy dabbling in fan theories and learning factoids about the production too. Everything after this tier delves into the realm where, if you talk about it in public, you'll probably get strange looks. Weeping angels are time lords. This is a fan theory born from speculation that the weeping angels have no given origin. They're explained to be very powerful, very ancient beings who are intrinsically bound to time itself. These facts, coupled with the fact that Rassilon felt the need to mention them during his speech in the end of time, caused much speculation that Weeping Angels were either some form of proto-Time Lords, or perhaps ancient Time Lords evolved into them. Because this is only a fan theory, there is no solid consensus on how the two races are actually linked. The Watcher the Watcher is a peculiar piece of Doctor Who lore, a mystery from the days before regeneration was as well defined as it is in the modern canon. This strange white being stood silently observing the Doctor and his companions, save for some telepathic communication the audience never gets to hear toward the end of his fourth incarnation, leading up to his regeneration into the fifth. At this point, the Watcher merges with Tom Baker, and Peter Davidson's fifth Doctor is born. The only explanation given was that the Watcher was the Doctor the whole time. Weird. In the expanded material of books and audio, Watchers are explained to be unregenerated future projections of a Time Lord's next incarnation, a sort of echo sent back in time, born from the moment of regeneration. Both the 5th and 10th Doctors have seen Watchers before their deaths in this expanded media. Unfortunately, this is the full extent of our understanding about them. Inspector Spacetime Inspector Spacetime is a parody of Doctor Who, a 1962 British sci-fi drama from the fictional world of Community, a sitcom created by Dan Harmon. The series follows the Inspector and his loyal constable as they battle Blorgons and travel through time or space, but never both. 
While an obvious riff on many of the staples of Doctor Who, what is most interesting about Inspector Spacetime is that it actually has a rather expansive lore, comprised entirely by community fans. The Inspector, which has had 13 incarnations, is an Infinity Knight from the planet Kaya Clash. Through the process of metamorphosis, the Inspector can change his face and personality, and can thereby be played by a new actor. He travels through time or space with his booth, or bioorganic omnidirectional time helix. The show also has an infamously terrible 1981 Christmas special, a reference to the similar Star Wars holiday special from the same era. There are a million of these hilarious nods to Doctor Who and other popular sci-fi series. I highly recommend you read the wiki if you want a good laugh. You can check it out at madmanwithabooth.fandom.com. The show actually received a very short-lived web series, quote, Untitled web series about a space traveler who can also travel through time, unquote, which saw seven episodes in 2012. It's really just a very fun rabbit hole to jump down. My favorite bit of trivia, though? In the community universe, every fan of the show hates the fifth inspector, the only female one. Their reasoning? Not because she's a woman, but because she sucks. This aired in 2013. Prophetic. Half human. This concept originated from the 1996 movie starring Paul McGann. In the film, the doctor confesses to a stranger that he's actually half human on his mother's side, not fully Time Lord. This is punctuated by the fact that the doctor is able to open the Eye of Harmony, something that requires human DNA. This idea is referenced once again during the 12th Doctor's run. Me suggests the Doctor's lineage is more complex than he lets on during the events of Hellbent, but the Doctor remains coy and chooses not to respond directly. Of course, this concept is meaningless in the wake of the Timeless Children reveal, but if you choose to ignore these recent changes to the canon, then there is an explanation for the, quote, damning evidence of the Doctor's human biology in the film. I explained several potential resolutions in my review of the movie, which, if you're curious, you can watch here. Rubber Toe Replicas This is a company that produces officially licensed, high-quality replicas of various props from Doctor Who. Known primarily for their recreations of sonic screwdrivers, they also sell a model vortex manipulator and have sold props like the Moment, a miniature Pandorica, the Confession Dial, and the Tome recounting the history of the Time War. Their site is basically nerd heaven, provided you have deep enough pockets. Headless Monks Killed Jack This is another theory, but seems to be very heavily implied by the main series. After being made immortal by the Bad Wolf, Captain Jack Harkness lived a life of adventure, protecting the Earth with Torchwood and occasionally adventuring with the Doctor. At some point, billions of years in the future, Jack becomes the face of Bo, an enormous head that many believe to be the oldest being in existence. As the theory goes, something had to happen to Jack to transform him from a humanoid into a talking head. During the 11th Doctor's tenure, River Song purchases a vortex manipulator from Dorian Maldivar, who claims he acquired it off the wrist of a handsome time agent. While Jack definitely fits that description, what's more interesting is that Dorium regularly made dealings with the Headless Monks. They even end up beheading him. It would make sense that the Monks were the ones to behead Jack. Their process keeps the heads of their victims alive, which would explain why Jack never regrew a body and became the face of Bo. Theta Sigma Theta Sigma was the Doctor's nickname in the Time Lord Academy. It was what he was called by other Time Lords, and was meant not to be spoken outside of the Academy. Despite this, it is not his real name. However, when many people stumble upon one of the sources of this information, Happiness Patrol or the Armageddon Factor, they mistakenly believe that this is the Doctor's true name. It is not. That said, it was part of the message that River Song left in the Pandorica Opens, as it was carved into the cliff face. Hashtag New13 this is a fan-made audio drama series, designed to replace the work of Chris Chibnall by rewriting the entire era, with a new 13th Doctor, new companion, and new stories. This series was created by YouTuber Beware, who- Hey! Who put this on here? 
But seriously, if you hate the Chibnall era and wish something different existed in its place, or even if you just want more Who content, give this series a listen. You might really like it. You can listen to the first seven episodes right here. The Doctor Married the Doctor's Daughter This is in reference to David Tennant, who married Georgia Moffat. Georgia is actually the daughter of Peter Davidson, so the Tenth Doctor married the Fifth Doctor's daughter. Even stranger, Georgia played the character Jenny on Doctor Who during the Tenth Doctor's run. She was the genetic amalgamation of the Doctor's offspring. She played the Doctor's daughter. So the Doctor married the Doctor's daughter in more ways than one. Very strange. Tier 5 People who know about the topics in this tier could rightly be classified as superfans. Nothing from here is simple or easy to wrap your head around. Every topic has at least two schools of thought regarding it. The Other One of the three ancient Time Lords that founded Gallifreyan society, the Other is a mysterious individual who worked alongside Rassilon and Omega to build the Citadel and found what Gallifrey would become in the future. Very little is known about the Other, but it is implied that after having a falling out with the other two founders, he tossed himself into the birthing looms on Gallifrey, and it is heavily implied that he was reincarnated as the Doctor. The Morbius Faces During the fourth Doctor serial, The Brain of Morbius, the Doctor faces off against Time Lord criminal Morbius, and they use a Time Lord technology to have a mental battle where their previous regenerations are shown on screen as they fight. After the fourth, third, second, and first Doctor's faces appear, several more then appear afterwards. While some people interpret these to be the faces of Morbius' previous regenerations, many believe them to be Doctors before William Hartnell. This was in fact the intention of the writers of the episode, but later stories seem to clearly retcon this idea until you get to the Timeless Children, but we don't talk about that around here. The Valyard During the Sixth Doctor story, Trial of a Time Lord, the Doctor is put on trial on Gallifrey for crimes against the laws of time. It turns out that his prosecutor is a Time Lord known as the Valyard, which is later revealed to be the Doctor himself, far in the future. The Valyard's exact identity is vague, but he exists as some form of the Doctor's darker nature from some point between his twelfth and final regeneration. The Valyard wanted the Sixth Doctor to be executed so that he could take the remaining regenerations as he was all out at this point. We haven't seen the Valyard return in any of the television media, although he has appeared in some audio dramas. Time will tell where exactly his creation falls in the Doctor's timeline. Lemonade and Dry Ice During the lead-in to the 50th anniversary special, The Night of the Doctor, we see Paul McGann's 8th Doctor regenerate after drinking an elixir meant to influence his regeneration to turn him into a warrior. However, in the novelization of the scene, it is revealed that the elixir was nothing more than lemonade and dry ice, and that the Doctor's desire to be a warrior is what would eventually transform him into John Hurt's War Doctor. The Woman While the woman could refer to many characters throughout Doctor Who, this is particularly in reference to the woman scene during The End of Time, the Tenth Doctor's final story. A mysterious character, her true identity is never actually revealed, although many speculate that she is perhaps the Doctor's mother. Some may think that she is the Doctor's daughter, perhaps she's Susan, or any other influential woman from his time on Gallifrey. Eight Recounted Age This is in reference to the fact that the Doctor's age is and always has been incredibly confusing, at least since the classic series ended. At one point during the Eighth Doctor audio dramas, the Doctor decides to reset his age to zero and begin counting again, as he forgot exactly how old he was at that point. This seems to rectify the fact that the Ninth Doctor claimed to be 903 years old, which is slightly younger than the Seventh Doctor said he was at several points. The Doctor might be 2,000 years old, he might be 1 million, he might be 4 billion. No one really knows for sure, and this is one of the reasons why. Curse of the Fatal Death 
The Curse of the Fatal Death is a hilarious comedy parody of Doctor Who, starring Rowan Atkinson, Mr. Bean, as the Doctor. Made for the Red Nose Day charity telethon in 1999, this parody episode follows the adventures of the Doctor and his companion battling against the Master and the Daleks. I would explain more, but if you haven't seen it yourself, I highly, highly implore you to go do so. It is absolutely hysterical for any Doctor Who fan. Also, somehow, it predicted that the 13th Doctor would be a woman. I have no idea how this happened. Big Finish. Big Finish is the company that produces the vast majority of Doctor Who audio dramas that exist. At this point, there's probably more Doctor Who content created by Big Finish than actual television episodes of the show. This is such an enormous backlog of episodes and stories that if you're hurting for more Who content, this is the place to go. I'll also note that Big Finish has a tendency to write stories that fill in or fix plot holes from the mainline series, and also offer some great stories for Doctors that receive rather poor writing during their own tenures. Just something to think about. Shalka. This refers to The Scream of the Shalka, a very short-lived Flash animated series designed to continue Doctor Who after the TV movie, with a new Doctor portrayed by Richard E. Grant. The series only had a few episodes before the 2005 revival was announced, and so this version of the Ninth Doctor never truly got to live on. There was one short story, The Feast of the Stone, which was published in 2004, but that is the end of this particular continuity. Rory is the Master This was a fan theory that originated in 2010 to 2011, while series 5 and 6 were originally airing. While this might seem like a ridiculous theory, you have to consider that there was actually a substantial amount of evidence to support it. First of all, Rory was not at all impressed when he first entered the TARDIS. Combine this with the fact that his daughter, River Song, has Time Lord abilities, and the fact that Rory somehow keeps returning from death repeatedly, to a rabid 2010 fanbase, this seems to make a lot of sense. Of course, Rory Williams is not the master, but it was a ton of fun when we thought he might be. Alternate Time Wars The Time War, as we know it from the Revival series, is not the first instance of a great battle between the Time Lords and an enemy ravaging the entire universe across all of time. What exactly constitutes a Time War is up for interpretation, but the concept itself has appeared in various different pieces of Doctor Who media, most notably the War Under Heaven, but we'll touch on that later. The very first instance of this concept was Alan Moore's 4D War in the comics of Doctor Who magazine all the way back in 1981. The existence of these alternate time wars gave credence to why the big one most viewers know from the Revival series is called the Last Great Time War. Strange Mouth Noises during the two-part episode from Series 3, Human Nature and Family of Blood, the Tenth Doctor records a set of instructions for Martha to follow while he is disguised as a human. In the episode, she fast-forwards through a large chunk of this instructions, but the full speech is actually available for anyone to view on YouTube. In it, he needs to talk non-stop for that portion of time, and so David Tennant just riffs about a band that he likes, some additional nonsense, and then he ends it by making what he describes as strange mouth noises that go like this. Bingle bongle, dingle dangle, yickety do, yickety da, ping pong, lippy tappy too ta. Look it up if you don't believe me. Cartmel Master Plan the Cartmel Master Plan was a narrative decision made by Andrew Cartmel, the script editor at the very end of the classic series run. He believed that the primary problem with the series was that the Doctor was no longer mysterious. His planet, his people, they've all been explored. So in order to add some mystery back into the character, Cartmel slowly started to allude to the fact that the Doctor was more than just a regular Time Lord. This idea was meant to lead to the reveal that the Doctor was in fact the Other, as explained earlier in this tier, and that he was essentially the reincarnation of a Time Lord God. This idea was never canonized in the TV show.
At this point, I'd like to take a quick break and ask that you please consider supporting me on Patreon. The BBC is notorious for copyright striking videos that easily fall into the realm of fair use, and because of that, all of my most popular Doctor Who videos don't see a shred of revenue. So if you're able and you enjoy my content, please consider making a monetary donation on Patreon. For just $1 a month, you can access my Discord server, where you can talk to me, as well as my production team, and the voice actors behind New 13. At my highest tier, you can even request for me to make a specific video of your choice. That said, liking, subscribing, and sharing the video are all ways that you can help me grow as well. But even just by watching this, you're helping me out. So, thank you. Tier 6. This is where things start to get really obscure. With most of these topics, even fans of the show are likely to scratch their heads if you bring these up. Proceed with caution. The Final Game This was the planned final episode of Season 11 of the Classic Series, meant to cap off the antagonistic relationship between the Doctor and the Master. Unfortunately, the episode was cancelled after Roger Delgado's untimely death. The story was to have a shocking revelation about the two Time Lords, that they were related in a way closer than most thought, perhaps that the Master was actually a proto-version of the Valyard, an amalgamation of the Doctor's darker side. This episode has since been recreated exactly in the same production feel of the episodes of the era by Studio Severn here on YouTube. If you like the third Doctor and the stories from this era of the show, I highly recommend you watch their seven-part story, The Final Game. Peter Davidson Meet This is a pretty funny one. Peter Davidson, who played the fifth Doctor, also starred as Meet, the living meal for guests at the end of the universe, an event from The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy 1981 TV series. There's not much more to this, it's just a fun little fact that most people don't know. Season 6B At the end of Season 6, the classic series, the second Doctor is exiled to Earth by the Time Lords and forced to regenerate. However, this is only the second regeneration to take place in the show so far, and it's not even called regeneration yet. On top of that, there was a six month gap between this episode, The War Games, and the third Doctor's first episode, Spearhead in Space. So during that six month gap, various publications continued to produce Doctor Who content featuring the second Doctor, but during his exile on Earth. This led fans to believe that perhaps the second Doctor didn't fully regenerate until Spearhead in Space, and that there was, in fact, a period of time where Patrick Troughton's Doctor was exiled on Earth, dubbed Season 6B. The canonicity of this season is, like most spin-off material, completely up in the air. Dimensions in Time Dimensions in Time was a two-part charity special crossover between Doctor Who and the soap opera EastEnders. It actually features the 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, and Seventh Doctors, and it also happens to be generally considered one of the worst pieces of Doctor Who media ever created. You can really only watch it as a parody to get any enjoyment out of it, but for those of you who are curious, it is available to watch on YouTube anytime you want. Zagreus sits inside your head. Zagreus sits inside your head. Zagreus lives among the dead. Zagreus sees you in your bed and eats you when you're sleeping. Michael Jackson movie. So this one was actually, nah, I'm just kidding. Zagreus is an anti-time creature from the 8th Doctor serial, Zagreus. This was both Big Finish's 50th story and it was released to coincide with Doctor Who's 40th anniversary. Because of this, it featured not only Paul McGann, but also Peter Davidson, Colin Baker, and Sylvester McCoy with a surprise appearance from the third Doctor, John Pertwee, done by using previously existing recordings of his voice. The actual story is incredibly complex and fascinating, but to simplify things as much as possible, the monstrous Zagreus is unleashed inside the TARDIS and it takes over the mind of the Doctor. To explain anything more than that would really be spoiling the story, so I suggest you give this one a listen but maybe not as your very first audio story. Michael Jackson movie. So this is a weird one. 
As you all know, after the classic series concluded in the late 80s, the BBC was shopping around for a way to revive the series, and eventually settled on what would become the 1996 television movie starring Paul McGann. But long before that, in 1989, Paramount Pictures actually pitched a version of the film to the BBC with Michael Jackson as the titular Time Lord. I'm not joking. And the kicker? Their second pick was Bill Cosby. That would not have aged well. The Corsair. Created by Neil Gaiman, the Corsair is another renegade Time Lord and friend to the Doctor. Their stories are scattered amongst various comics. Uh, the Corsair was one of the first instances of a Time Lord changing gender in regeneration, and was known to have an Ouroboros tattoo somewhere on their body in every incarnation. The Corsair met his demise in the Bubble Universe in The Doctor's Wife, also penned by Neil Gaiman. Put simply, this is Neil Gaiman's OC, The Guardians. Also known as the Sixfold God, Enlighteners, or the Accord. The Guardians of Time are elemental beings, each representing a fundamental aspect of reality itself. To be quite frank, they're basically like living infinity stones, and that's most likely what they were based off of. These are incredible cosmic beings, capable of tearing apart galaxies and altering time on a grand scale. As with lots of the cooler stuff from Doctor Who's history, there's a ton of confusing continuity following the Guardians. There are only supposed to be six of them, but sometimes there's just two, sometimes there's nine. In one story, they were created by Rassilon. In another, they existed before the universe itself. They're very hard to track, but they have some really fun stories that are written about them. The Doctor is the Master's brother. As discussed previously, the final game was cancelled due to Roger Delgado's death, and as I said, there was meant to be a big reveal in that story about the relationship between the Doctor and the Master. While we're not sure exactly what that reveal was, the most commonly accepted story is that the Doctor is the Master's brother. This was reinforced at one point, where the Doctor defeats the Master, and as he is supposedly burning to death, he yells, Doctor, how could you do this to your own implying brotherhood. Of course, this would be debunked later in Series 3 when the Doctor outright tells Martha that the Master is not his brother. But of course, if this is anything like the Morbius faces, maybe next year Chris Chibnall will give us all a surprise. And guess what? They actually are brothers! <sighs> oh god. Lungborough. This novel was published in 1997 and is the culmination of the Cartnell Master Plan. In the story, it is revealed that the Doctor is, in fact, the pseudo-reincarnation of the ancient Time Lord known as the Other. Because this was published in the wilderness years, between the movie and the revival series in 2005, its canonicity was up in the air, and still is to this day, although most people will agree that it is non-canon and that the Doctor is not the Other. Tier 7. Any sane person should turn back now. Understanding these ideas places you at the fringe of society, a walking repository of deep Hoovian lore. Renewal, not regeneration. When William Hartnell's first Doctor changed into Patrick Troughton's second Doctor, the concept of regeneration was only in its infancy stages. In fact, at this point, the writers of the show considered this to be something closer to renewal, as though his body had somehow reversed his age, not changed its genetic makeup. Even the transition from the second to the third Doctor was not called regeneration on screen, not by the Doctor and not by the Time Lords, it was just called changing his face. This led some to believe that the very first regeneration was actually not regeneration, and therefore did not count towards the 13 total lives available to the Doctor. As we know from our discussion of Season 6B earlier, the show's lack of clarity on these subjects led to quite a bit of speculation and theorizing by the fanbase. This is just one such example. Doctor Who and the Daleks. This is a really fun one. Doctor Who and the Daleks is a 1965 science fiction movie starring Peter Cushing as Doctor Who. That's right, not the Doctor, Doctor Who. This film was meant to capitalize on the popularity of the TV show and exists entirely inside its own continuity. 
Doctor Who is a kindly old scientist, a human from Earth, who built a time and space machine in his backyard. Due to an unfortunate mishap, Doctor Who, Ian, Barbara, and Susan, who are all very different from the television counterparts, are whisked away to an alien planet where they must face off against the evil Daleks. This movie actually received a sequel, Daleks Invasion of Earth 2150. If it wasn't clear from the names, the Daleks themselves were really what brought people in to watch these movies. They're a lot of fun. You can find relatively high quality rips of them on YouTube if you look just a little bit. But definitely know that they are nothing like the show that you may be used to. Time Lords are future humans. Yet another popular fan theory. This one posits that the Time Lords of Gallifrey are actually just the human race, who after billions of years of evolution, invented time travel, traveled back to the early universe, and founded a new world that would one day become Gallifrey. This theory was used to smooth over a lot of the strange inconsistencies of the canon or just simple questions that fans had, including but not limited to, why do Time Lords look just like humans? Why is the Doctor so fond of Earth? Why did the Doctor say he's half-human on his mother's side? This theory has been around for a very long time, and it's so popular that some people still think that it will eventually weasel its way into becoming canon at some point. But I doubt it. Marvel Comics Along with several other popular properties from the 1980s and 90s, including Transformers and G.I. Joe, Doctor Who actually exists canonically inside the Marvel Comics multiverse, specifically in the universe of Earth 5556. These stories, like many in Marvel Comics, covered the exact sci-fi cosmic adventures that you would expect from the Doctor. We even have an appearance from every Doctor 1 through 8 and a brief flash forward to an unnamed future Doctor. If you're into comics, especially from this era, definitely check these out, they're a lot of fun. The Dream Lord is the Valyard. As discussed previously, the Valyard comes alive at some point between the Doctor's twelfth and final incarnation. What most people assume this meant when he was first introduced was that he would appear during the Doctor's last lifetime. But now that we know that the Doctor has more than 13 lives, the Valyard could appear anywhere between the 10th Doctor and whatever the Doctor's final incarnation will be, perhaps the Curator? So if 10 is the earliest the Valyard could appear, perhaps the Dream Lord is the Valyard, or a pseudo-version of the Valyard still forming, as the Dream Lord was made from the darker aspects of the Doctor's nature. If this is true, it's quite possible that this is a nice out for the writers. They've shown us the Valyard's creation, and now they never have to think up anything clever to solve this ridiculously hard to answer question. Nelvana Cartoon In 1990, following the cancellation of the classic series, the Canadian animation studio Nelvana was pitched a potential Doctor Who animated series. The production never made it past the concept stages, but that does mean we got to see some of the concept art that could have been used in the show. It seems to have been set in a primarily futuristic world in its own separate canon, in the same style as Doctor Who and the Daleks. We see the Doctor, the TARDIS, K-9, and a companion or two. The Doctor appears to be a rough amalgamation of the third and fourth, at least in one of his designs. What I find most fascinating are the Dalek designs for this cartoon. They appear to be much larger and more battle-ready. Some levitate and others have treads like tanks. Fun stuff. The Master is the War Chief. The War Chief was a renegade Time Lord that appeared in the second Doctor story, The War Games. After his defeat at the hands of the Doctor, he was sent back in time, where he commanded a group of Nazi soldiers to do his bidding. Not much else is known about his character following this, but one particularly interesting theory is that this was actually the Master in an incarnation before Roger Delgado. The characters are strikingly similar, not only in motives and method, but also in appearance. Original Six Outfit Colin Baker's era of the show is plagued by several big issues, including the writing, budget, but most egregiously, this horrendous Technicolor dream coat. This terrible fashion choice was chosen to highlight the Doctor's volatile mental state. 
but I think we can all agree there are probably better ways to go about doing that. Anyway, Colin Baker himself was not pitched this outfit when he was explained the concept behind his doctor's personality. In fact, he recently described in an interview that his initial casting discussions included a description of his attire very closely matching what Christopher Eccleston would eventually wear as the ninth doctor. It's hard to imagine a world where the sixth doctor actually had drip, but it could have happened. The Decca. The Decca were a group of 10 young Gallifreyans in Time Lord Academy who made it their business to rebel and generally act like rabid children. Jokes aside, they genuinely believed that they could alter Time Lord society and make the universe a better place. Of course, the Doctor was among the members. And interestingly enough, one of the other members was referred to as Magnus, who was understood to have later become the War Chief, who was implied to be, that's right, the Master. Stories of the Decca are very sparse, usually only existing in dream sequences or flashbacks in novels. Tier 8. This is your final chance to leave. Everything beyond this level is so strange and esoteric that knowing about it will alter who you are at the most fundamental level. You have been warned. The Ghost of Matt Smith. In the first Doctor's final episode, The Tenth Planet, we see a very strange and unexplained event. While the Doctor is off regenerating, the controls of the TARDIS seem to magically move themselves. While this could be explained as a feature of the TARDIS being a living machine, there's actually a very interesting different explanation. In the 50th anniversary special, An Adventure in Space and Time, we see the story of Verity Lambert putting together Doctor Who in 1963. One of the final scenes of the film shows William Hartnell, depressed that he has to leave the show, receiving a vision of Matt Smith, reassuring him that he has created a legacy that will last long into the future. This scene is so wonderful, and it may or may not have made me cry multiple times, but the important part is this. Matt Smith actually plays with the dials of the TARDIS while he's here. And in the context of the scene, William Hartnell is the only one who can see him so he's invisible to everyone else. So this 50-year-old mystery, the source of these moving dials during the first Doctor's regeneration, was actually the ghost of Matt Smith. Faction Paradox. This one's a doozy. In the late 1990s, writer Lawrence Miles penned several Doctor Who novels exploring the idea of a grand calamity sometime far off in the Doctor's future, involving a Time Lord syndicate known as the House of Paradox. After his 1999 story, Interference, received negative reception from Doctor Who fans, Lawrence decided that he no longer had the right to continue producing content in the Doctor Who canon, and instead decided to write stories surrounding his creation, The House of Paradox, in a canon some might consider to be tangential to Doctor Who. Because the stories were legally not Doctor Who, they could not include terms like Time Lord, Gallifrey, or TARDIS. To work around this, the characters in the stories had different, often grander names for each of these concepts and locations. TARDISes were often called Great Houses, and instead of referring to various species as aliens, they were discussed as though they were gods. And obviously, the title of the organization itself was also changed, from House Paradox to the Faction Paradox. The Faction Paradox series exists in books, comics, and audio dramas, and has even had an installment as late as 2019. Officially, the Faction Paradox books are not canonical to Doctor Who, but some of the concepts that were introduced in the series are even adapted into Doctor Who stories, particularly Big Finish. So, that's why I like to describe it as tangentially canon. TARDIS Builders TARDISBuilders.com is a delightful little community that very few members of the fanbase know about. It is essentially a DIY forum for anyone interested in constructing their own TARDIS, interior, exterior, or any other potential piece of the time or spaceship you can imagine. 
There's a page for sightings where people can post pictures of TARDISes or just police boxes that they've seen out in the world, references for various designs uh, and size, color, and shape. There are also galleries where people often post their progress in building their own TARDISes, tutorials, 3D printing catalogs, and a bunch more. If you're the creative type who likes to work with your hands and you want a TARDIS of your own, this would be a great place to check out. The Master is the Timeless Child. This one is a theory, but pretty self-explanatory. We've only known about the Timeless Child for one episode in Universe so far, and of course many people, including myself, are not fans of the decision to make the Doctor the Timeless Child. Many people have come to the conclusion that it would have been better, narratively, for the Master to be the Timeless Child. It would give greater reasoning for why he has always hated the Time Lords, why they treated him so poorly his entire life, and why he ended up burning Gallifrey to the ground. Not to mention, it's very in character for the Master to lie to the Doctor about something like this. And so, some fans are still holding out hope that this particular theory is true. Jago and Lightfoot Jago and Lightfoot is a Big Finish audio drama series following the adventures of Henry Gordon Jago and George Lightfoot, both introduced in the Talons of Wang Chiang. As of 2018, there are 45 separate stories chronicling these two detectives solving mysteries revolving around alien threats in the 19th century. This is a pretty obscure one, but if you are starved for new Doctor Who content, and you somehow made it through all of the regular Big Finish stories, here you go. Third Doctor Levitation. This one is pretty silly, but has outlandish implications on the canon if you take it seriously. In a very short comic strip, in TV Comic Annual 1971, long before Marvel Comics started publishing Doctor Who, this strip showed the Third Doctor help the Brigadier stop an enemy spy by levitating. As it turns out, he learned to levitate <sighs> by reading about it in a book. So technically, the third doctor and every doctor following has the ability to levitate, but just chooses not to. I don't know, man. Leakly Bible. As you know, the classic series of Doctor Who was canceled in the late 1980s. While we all know it was revived in 2005, after the 1996 movie, the 96 movie was actually the last of several different attempts to revive the series. The Leakly Bible refers to an outline of a potential series story for a 90s reboot of Doctor Who, penned by John Leakly. This was meant to be a reboot, and so it would adapt portions of the previous continuity instead of directly continuing them. If you're familiar with JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, consider this like the transition from Part 6 to Part 7. Anyway, in Leakley's vision for Doctor Who, the Doctor is still a Time Lord, and one day discovers that he is the long-lost son of the infamous explorer known as Ulysses. It is then revealed that his enemy the Master has become Lord President of Gallifrey, and so the Doctor must begin a search throughout the universe to find his father so that the two of them can overthrow the evil Master. The very idea of giving the series an overarching plot is so antithetical to what we understand Doctor Who to be, but that was sort of the point. Leakley was hired to recreate the series in a way that wouldn't get cancelled again. Alas, Leakley was fired after the stories he wrote were deemed too serious to fit in with the vision the higher-ups had for Doctor Who going forward. While I don't like the idea of the original continuity ending after the Seventh Doctor, I would like to see what our world today would look like if they had decided to go forward with Leakley's version of the show. I think that universe would be really cool to explore. Delta Cubed Sigma X Squared Remember how Theta Sigma was the Doctor's nickname when he was in Time Lord Academy? Well, this jumbled mess of an equation is technically the Doctor's full real name. First, the similarities. Both terms include Sigma, implying that they are referring to the same person. But you probably want to know the origins, right? Well, in the 1972 book, The Making of Doctor Who, by Terence Dix and Malcolm Hulk, this equation is used interchangeably with the name Doctor. 
And beyond that, in the Marvel comics, there is a page that has this little equation, and scribbled next to it are the words, real name. Finally, it shows up in the TV show itself, in the 1983 story, The Five Doctors, right on the stone pillar. So, is it the Doctor's real name? I mean, technically, yes. But at the same time, the way you interpret it is what really matters. His name might literally just be a mathematical equation, or this is simply an equation denoting the circular Gallifreyan that spells out what his real name is. Or maybe his name is a Time Lord is particularly complex, and this equation is the only way a human brain can comprehend it. I honestly have no idea, but at least it's better than Basil. Dewan predates Missy. This is another fan theory designed to fix the terrible writing of the Chibnall era. Notice how there are quite a few of these. <laughs> anyway, this theory posits that Sasha Dewan's master does not follow Missy, but instead exists at some point between John Sim and Michelle Gomez. This would explain the sudden turnaround after Missy's character arc in series 10. Of course, if you're familiar with the Big Finish Missy series and her change into the Lumiot, then this theory doesn't matter all that much. It all depends on what you consider canon and what you don't. Iris Wild Time. Oh boy. Alright, stick with me here. What if Miss Frizzle from the Magic School Bus was canon to the Doctor Who universe? Then you would get Iris Wild Time. Her first appearance in Doctor Who media. Yeah, just in Doctor Who media, she's been in other stuff, was in the 1998 novel Short Trips, where it is revealed that she is the Time Lord who travels in a TARDIS that looks like a double-decker bus, to which she refers as the Celestial Omnibus. Iris continues to pop up in various other stories, and eventually receives her own spin-off series, where it is revealed that she is far more confusing than the Doctor could ever hope to be. Her time stream is completely out of whack for one or many reasons, meaning she actually has several different pasts that are all equally true. She's technically a Time Lord, a human, and a goddess, and she has said at one point that she doesn't even live her life in the right order. Whatever that means. Her stories are essentially very similar to the Doctor's, but typically include a bit more silliness and make a bit less sense. If you're up for a fun but very confusing time, check out Iris Wild Time. Tier 9. This level is Obscurity Incarnate. Only the most niche, the outcasts of humanity, ever make it this far. There's no turning back now. The Great Teabag Mystery. Doctor Who exists across virtually all forms of media. Obviously television, movie, comics, audio, some games, and yes, even a live production. I'm referring to Recall Unit, The Great Teabag Mystery. Now no, this isn't Doctor Who's only live production. There've actually been a handful. This is just the most obscure and the worst of all of them. The story was something else, seeing how it didn't include a single character from the television series, unless you count the Supreme Dalek or a pre-recorded voice of the Brigadier. That last one wasn't intended, Nicholas Courtney was meant to be in the play, but due to a scheduling conflict, had to pull out of the production. And that's about all I can tell you about it. It's really hard to find anything about this one anywhere on the internet, but I challenge you to look around. Timeless Children Leaks The infamous Timeless Children story arc that ravaged the fandom in early 2020 was actually not much of a surprise to a small portion of that fanbase. That's because the Series 12 story arc was actually leaked online as early as October 2019. The Master returning, his casting as Sasha Dewan, the lone Cyberman, the Death Particle, Ruth's existence as an earlier incarnation of the Doctor, and the Doctor's identity as the Timeless Child were all leaked online in 2019. What was so interesting about these leaks is that they were shared in a pretty vague way. The poster wanted to avoid being CNC'd by the BBC. 
So there was an intense chatter amongst the fan base discussing the clues he left and trying to pick them out as valid or not as the series aired. Of course, the Master appeared in the very first episode, and so this gave a lot of validity to the following predictions, which obviously all turned out to be true. So as many people were shocked and disappointed by the reveal of the Timeless Children, there was also a portion of the fanbase that could actively dread it coming for weeks at a time. <sighs> I was one of those people. Also, just a quick note, if you happen to like the Timeless Children and you're watching this video, I have no hate towards you. We just happen to disagree on this one thing, so hope it's all cool between us. 850 pounds plus court costs. The Doctor's TARDIS is modeled after a 1960s police box because the chameleon circuit malfunctioned and it's stuck this way and has been for as long as the Doctor has been adventuring, give or take one or two stories. That said, police boxes happen to be owned by the police. And that is why in 1996, the London Metropolitan Police decided to sue the BBC for stealing their design and using it for a profit. Seriously. Not only that, but the lawsuit lasted all the way until 2002. Six whole years. And the kicker? The police lost. After all of that, the court ruled that the London police had to pay the BBC £850 plus court costs in reparation for the overly litigious suit. Wacky. The final human death. In all of his time traveling the cosmos, the Doctor has seen quite a bit. But one of the more somber pieces of trivia about his adventures is that, depending on how you look at it, the Doctor has witnessed the final human death at at least one occasion. You could consider the death of Cassandra in the Russell T. Davies era to count as the final human death, but there are still many subspecies that existed, and so it wasn't a particularly upsetting moment. Now, I am referring to the death of Seo in the fifth Doctor story, Singularity. There's a lot to the story, but the important thing to note is that the universe is ending and the Time Lords have a way to live on afterwards, presumably into whatever universe arises next. The humans do not. And we get to see the fifth Doctor share a scene with a final human at the end of time. The Doctor watched the very last human die. Troughton's secret family. Patrick Troughton's second Doctor is infamous for his goofy clown-like persona, designed to mask a cunning, ingenious true nature beneath. Likewise, Patrick Troughton himself is not as wonderful as he may appear on the surface. As it turns out, Patrick Troughton left his wife in 1955 in order to spend his life with a woman he had been having an affair with, and they went on to have three children together. This would be bad enough, but Troughton actually managed to keep this double life a secret from his own mother for more than 20 years until she died. He was able to pretend that he was still married to his first wife for that entire time. Truly bizarre. The Stranger. What do you do when you want to keep making Doctor Who, but you're not legally allowed to? You make The Stranger. In 1991, Colin Baker and Nicola Bryant reprised their roles as the Doctor and Perry Brown, oh, I'm sorry, the Stranger and Miss Brown, in a direct-to-video series known as The Stranger. This video and later audio series is essentially Doctor Who in everything but name, with the Stranger and his companion traveling to different planets and time zones. They just never show exactly how they get there. Definitely, probably not in a blue police box. The series would go on to include various other Doctor Who alumni, including Nicholas Briggs and Sophie Aldred. This is a very weird, technically legal anomaly born from the wilderness years. Nothing more, nothing less. Also, Colin Baker wanted to get naked in this for some reason. I... Man, I don't know. Hayakawa Bunko. In 1980, the Japanese company Hayakawa Bunko published several books written by Terry Nation, obviously set in the Doctor Who universe. The only problem? 
The cover artist for these books was not given clear instructions as to what the Doctor or any of the aliens in the series looked like. Combine that with what I'm sure were poor translations and you get the incredible Hayakawa Bunko Doctor Who universe. It's pretty fun to look at these pictures of Daleks, which are kind of correct, and imagine which aspects were described and which weren't. It's like an artistic version of a telephone game. Oh, and the Doctor also does not look right at all. The first Doctor was a human scientist. When An Unearthly Child aired in 1963, the concept of Gallifrey, Time Lords, and Regeneration did not exist in the minds of the writers or producers. The hook of the show, as I'm sure you could tell from the title, was that the Doctor's identity was a mystery. The implication that was originally intended was that the Doctor and Susan were humans from the very far future. This would explain why their scientific knowledge was so great, why they had technology as advanced as the TARDIS, and why they seemed so unaccustomed to 20th century social norms. Obviously, we see the Doctor regenerate later, and it is explained that he is a Time Lord from Gallifrey. That said, in at least one instance, we see a scan of his body that shows he has only one heart, not two, implying that he is, in fact, human. No matter how you slice it, something has to be retconned here, so it is possible to believe that the first Doctor was, in fact, a human scientist. Tier 10 this is the lowest depth, the pinnacle of your search for knowledge. These ideas will fundamentally alter the way you perceive Doctor Who and reality itself. The greater key is the moment. The primary conflict of the Faction Paradox series is known as the War in Heaven. This is in fact one of the alternate time wars discussed previously. One of the most powerful weapons meant to be used in this war is known only as the Greater Key. It is described in a rather vague way, and therefore no one is sure exactly what it looks like. Some describe it to be a box covered in circular writing, while others claim that it is shaped like a metal rod. After the events of the Faction Paradox series, the Greater Key was sealed away. However, in the Day of the Doctor, we see the War Doctor acquire the Moment, a super weapon originally believed used to destroy both the Time Lords and the Daleks. Notice that the Moment appears to be a box covered in circular writing, but when it's about to be activated by all three Doctors, it extends a metal rod. The implication is obvious, the greater key is in fact the moment, further substantiating that the Faction Paradox series is canonical, or at least tangentially canonical. Hidden General Wiki Doctor Who General is an obscure fan-made wiki created by primarily users of 4chan. Yeah, that 4chan. It's less of a compendium of actual Doctor Who trivia, and more of a compendium of the various jokes and memes that have been shared between this community for the past decade or so. It also links to a discussion forum, but good luck getting in, that's password protected. The wiki is available to everyone, however the URL often changes, and it's not part of a typical domain. Of course, to maintain the integrity of this niche community, I would never do something so brash as to share that URL with you. The wiki is filled with numerous inside jokes, including how both everything and nothing is canon, every time a new episode is released, the show has now been ruined forever, and the various ages of the series. For those curious, we are currently in the Glitter Age. And fair warning, it's anything but politically correct. Cliff, Lola, and Biddy. During the series' infancy, many of the staples were still up in the air, including the look of the TARDIS itself. And one of the original scripts for the first episode, titled Nothing at the End of the Lane, the TARDIS was meant to be invisible, not take the form of a police box. In this version of the story, penned by C.E. Weber, the humans Cliff, Lola, and Biddy were to discover the Doctor's invisible time machine, which actually wouldn't do any time traveling, but instead would accidentally shrink them down, like in Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. While the episode was never made, and the companions' names were later changed to 
Ian, Barbara, and Susan, the general plot was eventually adapted into the Planet of the Giants. Notably, the script refers to the Doctor as Doctor Who, just like in the Peter Cushing Dalek movies. The Count of St. Germain The Count of St. Germain was a famous 18th century European explorer who had vast knowledge and interest in philosophy, science, the arts, and alchemy. Incredibly eccentric, he went by various different names and was described by the high society around him as an incredibly intelligent, very wise philosopher with seemingly endless knowledge of all subjects. What is most interesting is that he claimed to be 500 years old. His true origin was a secret, although after being arrested in England under suspicion of espionage, he recounted that he was Italian, Spanish, and Polish, a priest, a fiddler, a nobleman, and that he was married to an incredibly wealthy woman from Mexico. He was released the next day without charge. He was also known to be fluent in multiple languages, an excellent musician and singer, and was able to strike up meaningful conversation with educated people in all different sorts of fields. Towards the end of his life, he revealed to close confidants that he was in fact the son of a Transylvanian prince. He died in the late 1700s, but there have been multiple accounts of him appearing in public as late as the mid-20th century. If you haven't put two and two together yet, the implication is that the Count is really the Doctor. Now, if he's not the Doctor, I'll say this much. He's definitely someone the Doctor would probably like to talk to. Abbott's Perfect Companion In issue number 360 of Doctor Who magazine, Russell T. Davies revealed in an interview that Paul Abbott had at one point written a script for a series that revealed something astounding about Rose Tyler's history. She had, in fact, been genetically created by the Doctor to be his perfect companion. Her entire being and history a complete fabrication so that the Doctor would have an unmatched traveling partner. Davies vetoed the idea because he believed it ruined Rose as a character, but he loved the story itself and struggled with cutting it from the series. How mind-bending of an episode would that have been? I'm sort of hoping this gets adapted into a future story, but I'm not sure I'd like the Doctor to have done something so... upsetting. Hmm. Sunset at Montmajor. The Sunset at Montmajor is one of many oil paintings by the great Vincent van Gogh, dated 1888. It depicts a sunset over a garden landscape with unique foliage. What is perhaps most interesting is that in the upper left corner, a rectangular blue structure stands out against the skyline. Its authenticity as a Van Gogh original was only determined in 2013, three years after the 11th Doctor episode, Vincent and the Doctor. Clearly, there is the connection between Van Gogh and the Doctor that arises from the 2010 episode, but also, the blue rectangle in the top corner looks far closer to a TARDIS than the Mount Major Abbey that it's supposed to represent. The implications are obvious. Utah Cave Paintings Inside Utah's Horseshoe Canyon, several caves house ancient paintings known as petroglyphs left by indigenous peoples thousands of years ago. The greatest estimates place these paintings at up to 8,000 years old, although some argue they might be as recent as 900 years. They seem to show various people and animals, as are common in these sorts of petroglyphs, but what is most interesting is the large rectangular shapes with an individual raised portion at the center. It's a TARDIS. It looks like a TARDIS. From thousands of years before anything resembling a police box would have existed. Anthropologists posit that these designs are the early people's depictions of spirits or gods, otherworldly beings. I wonder what tall, box-shaped phenomenon could have inspired them to believe it was something divine. Perhaps appearing and disappearing out of thin air? Dr. Omega Doctor Who premiered in 1963. Half a century earlier, Dr. Omega was released by French writer Arnold Gallopin. 
the titular Dr. Omega and his two companions travel to Mars in a machine of his own design. On Mars, they run into multiple different alien species that they have to evade before eventually returning to Earth. Obviously, there are some surface-level similarities to Doctor Who, but what is most astounding is that Dr. Omega himself bears an incredibly strong resemblance to William Hartnell as the first Doctor. This is so obvious, it's even stated as a fact on the book's Wikipedia page. Go look it up, I'm not joking. Dr. Omega is not listed in any of the original transcripts or production notes by Verity Lambert or any of the production staff for the original series. And so, it's completely up to speculation whether or not this book was inspiration for the series, or instead, a very strange, even unearthly coincidence. Whoo! And that is it. You have made it to the very bottom of this iceberg. What did you think? Anything you want me to expand on? Is there something you think should have been on this list but wasn't? Let me know down in those comments below. I want to thank you all so much for making it this far and watching till the end. Your support and viewership means the world to me. Remember to like, subscribe, ring that bell, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I have been Beware. Stay frosty.